good about that. Hi, we're back with God Shots. And Darlene and I are talking about letting go. I'm Lydia Cornell. This is Darlene Spurlaza. And so we were discussing some of the great thinkers and how they all have great wisdom for us. And you were talking about Wayne Dyer, whom I love. What's the last? Did you read his book called You'll See It When You Believe It? I've read a lot of his work. I don't know that I particularly read that book, but yeah, a lot of his work and I've watched a lot of, yeah. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's all an inside job. Everything in the universe that we think we have to struggle so hard for, if you get your spiritual center right or your heart right, and you stop worrying and striving and stressing and controlling, and you kind of let go with the flow, and you take these baby steps of going with the flow, things work out better than if you're trying to control it too much. I've never seen a watched pot really boil. I actually watched a pot once and it didn't boil. But I'm saying whenever I'm too, I actually sat there and watched it. But whenever I'm too into my own business, mm -hmm. I'm like so over analytical. I crush it. It's like I can't see the forest for the trees. Exactly. You know, I'm killing it. And I don't mean that in a good way. Well, I have a little story to share with you. And um, I kind of have reservations sharing this, but I really think it's going to help some of our listeners. Um, so I recently started a new part of my career because as people probably know, I'm a doctorally prepared nurse practitioner and I'm in academia. So I'm teaching five days a week. And recently, within the past six weeks, I received a phone call from the superintendent for the Methodist ministry in West Virginia. And unbeknownst to me, parishioners had gone to her about me coming to be the pastor of this church. Now, in 10 years since I've had this pastoral degree, I've never preached. I, I've stepped in for preachers, but I've never preached. So this is kind of a new thing for me. This is brand new. And the reason I'm sharing this is because something happened and this is where I had to learn to keep my mouth shut. And that's very difficult for me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I, ha I want to, I want to fight back. I yeah. want to have my opinion heard. I have something to say to everybody. It's not a good thing. It's better just to be quiet. And I'll tell you why, because the higher power will take over and he can do it better than anybody. So here's the story. So I'm going to, I'm going to do my first Sunday at this church and I was nervous and my parents are both still living and they drive and they go and they've been to this church and I get a call from my mom and she's like, we're not going to come to listen to you. We know it's your first sermon, but we're going to go to our regular church because we have a new preacher and we feel that we need to support him. <gasps> now, internally i'm going uh you know because it's kind of like i'm not coming to support your daughter you know and i just wanted to lash out and be yeah. like really and but i said nothing and i was just kind of like okay and first time in my life and i'm sharing this with you people i'm being very transparent because i feel like maybe it could help somebody i said nothing and this was on saturday so sunday i go and do the sermon and i get a call from my mom and she's like well she goes, I feel very guilty right now for not coming to hear you preach. And I'm like, really? Why? And she's like, well, she goes, we went to hear our new minister. And she goes, there was X amount of people there. And she goes, there was new people there. So I went up to the new people. Mind you, my mom's 83. Oh, wow. I went up to the new people to welcome them to the church and ask them to come back. And it was actually the parents of our new preacher. And they had driven eight hours from North Carolina to come hear their son's first sermon. Oh, how wild. <laughs> you get to get that. <laughs> and so my mother understood then that maybe she should have supported her daughter. But, you know, people only know what they know. You know what I mean? And so it's like, but I found at that point, and the reason I shared that story is I love my mother. Don't get me wrong. I love my mom and dad, and I'm not saying anything negative. But what I am saying is I could not have done that any better than what God did to oh, show her exactly. what would have been right. Right? Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. Sometimes I think I have to go in and fix everything. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, if I let, if I stop, I'm quiet. And I don't argue, and I don't ma you know manipulate. 
it's all they they get the message faster if it's meant to be gotten if it's yes. really their their message oh my god i love you for that thank you yeah and so um you know i have so many of those stories that if we can you know those are the god shots that we talk about mm -hmm. and if you can stand back and just let god be god yeah and us be us it just works out so much better you know um there's i want to read you something we keep talking while i find it go ahead okay but yeah and i have found that with multiple things my children mm -hmm. um my grandchildren my parents my friends my my significant others it's just kind of like let them be who they are and god will be the person to guide them exactly in control of anybody like i think i am <laughs> i wish yeah. i could do that more with my son i think i have taken my hands off rush rushing over there like a maniac and i'll have to tell you two quick stories after this but let me read you yeah. this first this is a little card i got in the 12-step program from a friend early on who handed out his business card and on the back of it was this let go and let god as children bring their broken toys with tears for us to mend i brought my broken dreams to god because he was my friend but then instead of leaving him in peace to work alone i hung around and tried to help with ways that were my own at last I snatched them back and cried, how can you be so slow? My child, he said, what could I do? You never did let go. Mm, perfect. It's like, it's like perfect. Beautiful higher power wants to get in there and help us, but we're in the way worrying, first of all, by manipulating, worrying and doing our own stuff too much. We don't even see the solution because we're so busy focusing right. on the problem. We couldn't see the help if it was there. So we've blocked out the sunlight of the spirit. But when, if we do let go, that's when the beautiful masterwork comes in and the handicraft and everything is done in this way. Exactly. It is invisible to us. Exactly. And you know what? I've heard so many stories when people just finally let go, it just all works. Um, like I have a sponsee right now who's getting ready to move to Florida mm -hmm. and it, it just kind of, she kept holding on and saying, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And then eventually her husband got moved. He's gone already because he got a job. <laughs> so he's living down there. Oh, yeah. Everything has fallen into place. The company's packing up her house. She'll be out of here by <laughs> July 14th. Yeah. And she's on this journey. Here's, here's an interesting thing. Her father, who she's kind of estranged from, lives in the same town that they are going to to live mm. where the where her husband's job is he's an alcoholic that's still active she has 12 years in recovery and i told her i said can you just look at this like you're on a mission you're on a mission yeah. you're going to take care of something just Perfect. relax you know there's always a plan and just like your card said get out of the way all we have to do is just get out of the way. <laughs> Stand there and block it. Your hands off it. Take contrary action. When you when you re, when you feel like you want to react or blow up at somebody or or give them your sense of a piece of your mind, do the opposite. See what happens. See, just try something mm -hmm. new. And yep. it's amazing what contrary action does. If if the other thing hasn't been working for you, try that. Like when yeah. I, I my last relationship, I was you know dumped by a guy. And I cried and I was hanging on, manipulating ways to go meet him so he could see me looking thinner or prettier that day. I kept thinking, why didn't, why did he dump me? Well, obviously it was part of the plan. Because six months later, I met the one. The one that I could never in a million years have designed this one. You know, right. so good for me. <clears throat> and I didn't know. I just was clinging to the, the asshole that was... You know, it's like I heard a woman in the program say, I was hanging on to his cowboy boots while he dragged me out the door. You know? <laughs> we've, we've, all, we've all done that. We've all done that. That's just, <laughs> yes. You know, but, one of these days I will share some stories about that type of thing. Um, but right now I just, um, I, I would like to tell you about the blue baby. Can you hear and the I dogs barking? What's that? Yeah, two crazy dogs here that are so cute. Oh my God, McFly and Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> they were making themselves known. We can yeah. hear. <laughs> but 
but that's good. It makes it real and it makes it authentic. And I like that. But let me tell you about the blue baby, because this story is always stuck in my head. And I thought it teaches us a lot how to let go of what we really want to do, because we never know what's really going on behind the scenes. Right. Yeah. And so here's the story. Like you have a brand new car, right. And you're driving down the road and some maniac comes flying by you, scrapes your car, keeps going. It's like a hit and run brand new car. And then you become angry. Right. And you're like, I'm not going to let this person get away with this. They are not going to hit my car and damage my car. I just bought this car. It's my car. I don't want anything to happen. It's all about me, 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 me. Right. (laughs) And so you're chasing them down the road at hundred miles an hour and following them. And you go cruising right behind them, right into the ER parking lot, right, right up to the doors of the emergency room. Guy jumps out of the driver's side, reaches in the back seat and pulls out a blue baby and runs into the hospital. Oh, and you're sitting there going, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my and God. I'm behind him. Why? Right. Oh. And, and so we never know everything that's happening has a reason. Right. And we always spin it towards the negative. Right. Like you damaged my car and you meant to do that. And no, that isn't what happened at all. Oh. So we really shouldn't have any thoughts about what we need to tell other people about what's happening because oh we God. don't know. We don't know what's happening. You're so right. That reminds me of Stephen Covey, who wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Yes. Win-win. I think I might have said this on another podcast, but um, he said, if you were in line in a store and the people ahead of you were taking so much time, one guy kept dropping things and you were huffing and puffing and going, I'm late to work and and you're just like grumbling at the guy. And if you knew that that man just lost his wife that morning, and the mother of his children who are standing there being obnoxious and with runny noses, if you knew that little piece of information, wouldn't you be more kind? I mean, wouldn't that just make you want to help the man instead of bitching at him? We never know. Right. And That's so shouldn't we, shouldn't we always take the high road always. and assume that we need to be kind to these people because they, they need something, they're hurting, instead of being judgmental and cruel? Oh, I, I mean, you just said, shouldn't we always take the high road because we should always assume the mm-hmm. best, not the worst. That's, that's right. That's a really important point right there. Yeah. And I do believe that. And, um, and I will say this um, about relationships because, you know, you said you were in, in these relationships and you're hanging on and you're being drug and then this <laughs> wonderful thing comes into your life. Right. And God's so just waiting for you to let go. <laughs> I can't put somebody there until you let go of this. <laughs> exactly. I was so, like a, an idiot. I was such an idiot. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, 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 so, I so understand that. That's hysterical. <laughs> if I could describe the, the, the other person, you would die laughing, but I can't on the air. Um, <laughs> I mean, oh, the, the truth about him. Um, but... But also, by the way, in every relationship, I believe only the good remains, which is why I can't really harbor bad thoughts about my ex-husband because we really had a juice, a beautiful life. We had so many adventures, even though there was this undercurrent of craziness and in the ultimate end, I mean, there was a lot of bad, but when I look back at him, I think I chose that relationship, probably knowing a little bit more than I, sh- and I you know, I pretended not to know so much about this man right. and I, I have to take responsibility I can't play the victim on, on everything I'm doing you know I don't want to you know I have this friend of mine I always say it's my turn to be the victim let me let me feel sorry for myself the only medication I'm on is self-pity anymore <laughs> I don't have drugs or alcohol <laughs> <laughs> the only medication I'm on is self-pity but um anyway I look back at my marriage and I go wow it was a really great marriage there were so many goofy things that happened. He right. did. He wasn't so honest in the end. But the truth is, we had so much good, and that's all I want to remember. Mm-hmm. So there, you know, pick that out and look at it. Doesn't mean you go back with the person, though. And you know, and you know what I think too. I think there's a song out, and I wish I could remember who sings it. I know it's country, and it's called "The Broken Road." Mm. And all of the broken pieces led me straight to you. Oh, I love that right. song. I know that song. I don't know who sings that, but it's it's a fabulous song. And 
you know, I look at my life today and I got to say that I have been given many gifts and many blessings, including relationships. And I just am so grateful, grateful for a smile and a laugh and a cuddle and just the fun and back into life, back into the stream of life. And it just feels so good, you know, and I didn't plan it. I did not plan it. I didn't, look for it. I didn't want it. I didn't do anything. And God put it right in front of me, right in front of me. And it was just like, is this amazing or what? You Isn't know, that weird how that happened to both of us. It's like, what? I, that I definitely, yeah. <laughs> the minute I surrendered the other thing and I actually asked, this is a really interesting thing. A few years ago, I was dating a man that I wasn't attracted to at all. And I was like, <laughs> oh God, it's getting late in life. I got to settle down. I need a companion. I can't be alone. I don't like being alone. And I kept trying so hard to like this guy and I wouldn't even, I couldn't kiss him. I couldn't, I just, we were just like good friends. And then I kept thinking, you know, he needs to meet his soulmate. He really is a good guy. He needs to meet the one for him. So I got on my knees and I surrendered. I said, please let me let go of him. So I'm not so greedy because he was doing a lot of sweet things for me. Like, you know, putting in my hardwood, you know, polishing my floors and refinishing and stripping the wood. And he was such a great friend. But I was being selfish. I was not using him, but I was, I would like hanging out with him and I didn't want to lose him. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I was being a little greedy. Yeah. Okay. But the minute I got, I literally got on my knees this time and I said, let me let go of him. Let him find his true love. Please let me stop being so selfish. And whatever's meant for me, for me, I, I'll accept it. I was kind of like letting go of him. Literally three days later, he met the love of his life. And then I got pissed off. I went, why so quickly? <laughs> right? Yeah, we don't like those kind of things. <laughs> but I think, I think like the crux of this whole letting go and letting God is the fact that I've seen enough God shots to know that when I do let go of what I think I need, God puts something in there so much better. Always, always. And you know, like right now I sit here and I'm in a position in my life right now, working with you, working at the university in a relationship that is healthy. Wow. And I, 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 I just like pinch myself and say, okay, is this, am I going to wake up? <laughs> I know. Is, is this for real? You know, and it's just really kind of a cool thing, you know, I feel the same way. It's really, I've never laughed. So I love laughing. I love humor. And I'm with somebody who makes me laugh every five, every minute. I mean, we're just, it's so fun. It is. It's, it's fun. That's the word for it. And it's just, just fun. Yeah. And to somebody who cares and you can, they can hear you. I used to, <laughs> I used to pick guys that would never listen. And I'd have to like do cheerleading thing. You can you, can I, can you get five minutes of your time? Yeah. Some yeah. Reason. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you a funny story. I mean, like silly stuff that you start noticing. Now I've lived where I've lived for over 20 years, right? So what happens in my yard, my neighborhood, you would think that I'm pretty aware of it. Yep. And so I'm out, I'm outside and my friend is leaving and it's dark. It's like 930. And I hear this, like, well, I don't know what it is. It sounded like chirping or something. And I said, I was like, geez, those birds are up late. <laughs> it's like, that's not birds, that's frogs. <laughs> that's what? What was it? What? Frogs. Frogs. Oh my God. Birds don't, birds don't do that at night. Oh and this is, this is the kind of life I'm living right now. Just constant <laughs> laughter. <laughs> I, know. I love it. And I feel like I'm about 12 and it's working for me. You know? yeah, yeah. I, I haven't seen you laugh this much in a while. It's That's been a while. Impressive. It's been a while. And it's, it's really, it's really, and I just think it makes you feel younger and more vibrant and wow. uh, just brings lots of love into your soul. And guess what? When you have it for yourself and you're full of it, what happens? It overflows into everybody, right? Oh boy, does it ever. I think we are meant to spread. They say, share your joy. You share your pain. You cut it in half, share your joy. You double it. Right. And I really think we're meant to, um, inspire others, encourage others. 
And when I, or I see somebody smiling, I go, oh, there's hope. It's like you walk down the street and people are glum and morose. You go, oh my God, I, it's the worst that I thought. But when you see somebody out there thriving, it gives you hope that it's possible to thrive. Exactly. In spite of all the bad news that we hear in the world constantly, and we're, I think this is, we're hearing too much news. We are, like we are. And that's why I believe some, something like this needs to come forward full force to be the resisting point of all the bad things we're hearing. You can't have just all bad. You've got to have good coming in. There has to be that balance. That's right. And, you know, like you talked about the people walking around and their heads hanging down and all this stuff. And there's so many, I don't know about where you're living, but there are so many young kids back here on drugs and stuff. And I think they're just trying to numb out. Yeah. And what they don't realize is I'm numbing out and in a fun way, I laugh until my stomach hurts. Right. You know what I mean? And it's just the best. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to be numb anymore. I want to feel every second. Oh, I just wrote that in the book I'm writing. I said, when I got sober, not only did I feel all my feelings, but I have to tell you every feeling it's worth it. Yes. I mean, everything comes, you start to feel more passion, more first. For, I don't feel pain though. Honest to God, I feel more pleasure than pain. Pleasure is temporary, but deep joy for no reason. Like you said, happy for no reason. That is, that is really cool. I mean, I actually fell in love with butterflies and nature and really nerdy things when I got sober. I was like, right? whoa, I never knew. The world was so beautiful. Because I was so busy <laughs> staring at my problems. I couldn't look up, you know? Right. And I know. And that's what, and so I guess that if, if I could give any message to people that listen to this, it's like trust. Mm. Trust. I mean, you have at least with me, I mean, you, you, Lydia, have more of a background with Hollywood and, and experiencing a lot of things. Myself, I mean, I'm a country bumpkin. I'm from West Virginia. Yes, I have tea. <laughs> yes, I for well, shoes. <laughs> but, but the thing is, I mean, you're not a country bumpkin, but I know what you mean. It's, it's, it's just like, so, but all of these wonderful things have transpired. So basically what I'm saying is I'm not unique. I am as normal as it comes. And if I can experience this, so can you. You yes. know what I mean? Yes. And so can everybody that's listening to this because I, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not unique. Yeah, it's I just, know what you mean. I know what you mean. By the yeah. way, I'm from El Paso, Texas, and I grew up in New York, and I had a dream to come to Hollywood because I was seeking, now I, I wrote this in a strange way, but I was seeking the adoration of strangers to fill me up thinking I had to be on a stage to get the love I couldn't get at home. And it took me a while to realize all that because I came up in a, a really good family looking from the outside, but we never had much money. And my father was born in Russia, raised in Shanghai, China. He was an expatriate. He was uh, fleeing the revolution of Russia with his parents as a baby. And he grew up to become a violinist in Shanghai and with the Shanghai Philharmonic and exotic, beautiful man. But he became a citizen when I was four years old, met my mother at the Hollywood Bowl. She ran away from home and had a really troubled life. So, but I do have to say my great-grandmother, my great-great-grandmother is Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, which helped, you know, end slavery. And my other great-grandmother was the most amazing woman. She was a detective in the vice squad for 25 years, the first female police officer in the Wild West. Wow. And um, did so much for other people. She was voted Mother of the Year in her 80s when I was a little girl and saved lives and ran a convalescent home and raised two little girls on her own. And it's just an amazing women in our background. So I have to look at all the good with the bad. You That's know, right. My, my precious sweet mother suffered from this borderline or bipolar disorder. And she had a mother who also didn't know how to raise girls and favored the boys. And it was just a, a sequence of tragedy. And I don't know if I believe in the curse as much as pain in people's lives. They express it differently and they, they punish others. They punish their children in ways they shouldn't. It's hard to know. Back in my mom's day, they didn't believe that children should, be, should talk. They said, be seen and not heard, I was always told. Yes. 
So I just want to share one thing I forgot to share, which is really important. We had a kind of a supernatural event when my mother died. And I haven't shared it publicly at all. I'm going to talk about it again on another podcast. But the week my mother passed away, she'd been, she had dementia for about a year. And dementia means you really can't swallow anymore after your brain shuts down and it won't let you swallow. So my sister and I were feeding her with sponges, giving her water that was thickened with a gel and dipping sponges into it on popsicle sticks and hoping that she would suck on the sticks so the water would go down her throat and trying to feed her so that she would get some nutrition but eventually she was so emaciated and it was pretty frightening at the very end and then she I kept saying to her mom you can go you can go don't you don't have to hang around for us I wanted to, we wanted to release her and she held my hand really tight for about eight hours one day. The whole day I played music, I read to her from the Bible, I read to her from Mary Baker Eddy. And three days later, she decided to leave. Kathy said it happened when she was out of the room for a minute, comes back and mom is gone, she passed away. And she didn't look happy when she died. It was, um, her face was contorted, not happy at all. So Catherine covered with a sheet and lay by her side, and there's a dog visiting named Meltzer, a sweet little dog that my, their friend dropped off to just keep my sister company. This dog lay next to my mother the whole night, and at 10 p.m. at night, Kathy was awakened by the wind going through the room. This is going to be sounding a little bit weird. She'd opened the window earlier, but this wind went through the room, and the candle was burning, it was flickering. The dog was barking at the ceiling, the dog undid the sheet over mom's face and started kissing mother, kissing her. Wow. And then the dog covered my mom up again, like frantically tried to cover mom up again. In the morning, Kathy looked at my mother and took a picture, which I have. My mother was smiling with a, a peaceful look on her face I've never seen in my life. She let go so completely it was like an it was like an angelic. She had a smile on her face. I'm not kidding you. She hadn't had a wow. smile like that in the past five years. You know, I hadn't seen her smile like that the whole year of dementia. So whatever happened, and my sister who my sister wrote me a text at the time because we were looking on the camera. She said, "I have goosebumps. Something happened in death. She was transformed, and I knew what it was. She saw my brother, my baby brother who died earlier, my father." her husband, all her loved ones, you know, and um, mm -hmm. there's no doubt that she's at peace right now. Wow, that's incredible. And I'm just so glad that you were able to have that journey with her. Me too. You know, and there was so much healing that happened for everybody. I know. And, um, that and was Tom just Lovitz, a friend of mine who um, is Jewish and didn't ever believe in this kind of thing before. He had an experience like this earlier in his life. I have to tell you this really quick. He's an actor, famous actor from Saturday Night Live. He played with Dana Carvey and he was the liar on Saturday Night Live in the 80s, late 80s. You all remember John Lovitz. Um, he went on, He had a huge fight with his father, who was a doctor. His father was a doctor and he had a huge fight with his dad. Dad was always on his case about his showbiz career. And John said, look, dad, I'm leaving. They had a fight, a blow up. They didn't make up. And John went off to do a movie with Dana Carvey and Nicolas Cage up in Canada. i, I got to find the movie title for you. And he was up there and he found out his dad died two days later. And he could not mm -hmm. forgive himself. John went, he was so upset over this. He couldn't leave the set because he was under contract to finish the movie. And while he was up there in Canada, he had a dream one night that his father was standing there in heaven holding hands with all these relatives. And his father said, John, let me go. I love you. We're fine. I forgive you. You forgive me. We're good. Have a great time. And, and he just was really loving. And he said, by the way, tell your mom Aunt Edna says hi. She'll know what I mean. John wakes up in the morning. He's like, what was that dream? He calls his mother. He goes, who's Aunt Edna? She said, oh, you never even, you never heard of her. She was your grandfather's sister, you know, a generation ago that John had never met. Wow. And wow. that was the funny key to the whole thing. John, to this day, is the biggest believer I've ever met. And so wow. he, when I shared about my mother, he went, 
But yet, your mom is, there is no death. Your mom is with your whole family now. So it just made me feel so good inside, you know? Yeah, that, that's a fabulous story. I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff that happens. Yeah. You know, somehow, some way you get messages. And let me tell you what, when I did this um, preaching stint on Sunday, years ago, I went to a card reader and the card reader, I mean, this was probably 25 or 30 years ago. It's been a while. And she said to me, she, I was very scared. She goes, you don't have to be scared just because you're Catholic. And I said, well, I'm not. And she goes, oh yeah, you are. <laughs> and so then she, she said, okay, your spirit guides are here. And she was taping all this. And she goes, oh, wait a minute. Here's your grandma, right? And she goes, your grandma wants you to know that she's watching over you, that she sees you, that she's going to always be with you. Don't worry about anything. Stop crying, right? Lady talks a few more minutes and she goes, oh, grandma's back. And she goes, oh, she wants you to know it's Margaret. But Margaret was my dad's mother's name. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this is kind of creepy. Well, when I went to do this service, my mother sent me a picture, unbeknownst to me, unasked for, of my grandmother, Margaret, and me in 1963. I would have been four years old, dated July. I, my first sermon was in July. Oh, my God. And not only that but somebody had driven an hour and a half to be at this sermon. They didn't know why. All they know was they got a phone call that this woman preacher was coming in and they should come and listen to me. You're kidding. They were from my grandmother's city, Middleburn, West Virginia. Oh, how weird. And this girl says to me after she heard me, she goes, I'm coming back next week and I'm bringing friends from my grandmother's city. And I'm like, this is weird. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. I but, love those little sparkly. Those right. Little and so when you were talking about your friend, John, yeah. it just, you know, and his aunt Edna, it just reminded me that I've also had God shots with people that have passed. Oh my gosh. How cool. So I think it's just a continuum. I don't it's think continuum. you don't die. It yep. just changes. And I think the veil, if anybody has read that book, the shack or seen that movie, it's just the veil is so thin between here and there. I believe that. Oh my God. You just remind exactly. I totally believe that. I talked to someone else this week who said they, you know, we don't die. I know it for a fact. I know it. I mean, the fact that yeah. my brother, so many beautiful things happen to give us those signs. And I don't know how much we're supposed to look for signs, but the God shots are actually synchronicities that are uncanny. And, and it's like a matching puzzle piece. It's like, Supply meets need meets supply or supply meets need. And right. like the trumpet, I've had so many financial God shots and so many beautiful little glimmers of hope that come out of nowhere. And the fact that I was lonely and met like the guy that I'm with now, I didn't think I'd meet anybody either. Just like you. It's like, wow, where'd this come from? Right. Exactly. I <laughs> let go every single time I let go. Yeah. And letting go of letting go of relationships or things that you think you want is not easy folks not no. easy i mean because you think that if you let go you lose everything and we tend to forget that if we let go that void is going to be filled with something else exactly that's the key now here's it's hard when you're in the throes of let's say a job offer or let's say a job you really wanted or you worked so hard in your college degree and you got this you got shut out of a job you wanted and that is, you're in that visceral pain, but if you can let go fast enough, and it takes practice, but it takes a certain amount of trust in the goodness of the universe and in God, which, which I call God, some call the goodness of the universe. But if you can really let go, it means shake off the mortal chains, do whatever ritual you need to get on your knees to let go, actually say out loud, I surrender. You know, there's different methods. Take a walk, pray. I have actually learned, I actually visualize throwing the football in God's lap. I go, I, don't, I can't deal with this problem anymore. Take all these problems in a ball and I throw it. <laughs> I said, I just take a physical ball and throw it. Um, yeah. you, letting go is getting the problem out of your body and, and walking in the other direction and letting it, letting it solve itself. It always solves itself quicker. Even lawyers say that if you don't return a client's phone call, you wait three days, the problem always solves itself anyway. 
<laughs> and the stress is over. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. We cling to pain. We cling to worry. But we have, there's got to be methods to practice letting go. And what's your best way to let go? When you pray, do you have an expectation that the problem will be solved? Or do you go, it's too big for me. I can't do this by myself. You know what I've learned? That this is just my path. This is just my journey. Because I'm not a person. I would be lying if I said, oh, it's really easy. I just get on my knees and give it to God and walk away. Uh, unfortunately, I do get on my knees. I do give it to God. And the minute I get on my feet, I take it back. <laughs> okay, you can have it for that second. Now it's mine again. I never completely give it over. But what, but what I find is that in my feeble attempt to let it go, God knows my heart. He knows that I'm trying as best as I can to let something go, right? And he has always intervened oh. and taken it. And sometimes I set in shock. Sometimes I may cry. Sometimes I may be happy, but he moves it or he takes it or he does something. But whatever that problem was, is removed. You just completely changed everything for me right now. Thank you so much for saying that. Because I've had wrestled with that gap in between praying and knowing that I should be able to let go and not really thinking, I think I'm doing something wrong. And you're right. There's a, there's a strange intervention. There's a, there's a, a moment of knowing that God knows my heart. Right. Motivations are, usually, are almost always good at this point, to be honest with you. I never pray for selfish desires that would ever hurt anybody else. It's just right. for something with grace. And, yeah. and so that's how it works for me. And he's and, 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 and the higher power is the person that has the ownness of doing it. And unfortunately, that also comes in his timing. Did and so that? I can say that, that again. The higher power has what? He has the ownness. He oh. is the person or, or, or the power is the person or the, the field or the energy field that has the power to actually change the situation. Right. I don't. Right. But it's also in that timing. It's not my timing. Oh. I, can, I can want it gone tomorrow, today. And he could be like, no, no, this lesson needs to continue until two months from now. Oh, but that. when the time comes, when the power decides the lesson, I've learned the lesson and I can move to the next one, it's gone just like that. No oh, more questions asked. That's it. The force, the power. I think of in Star Wars, the force, the force of love, right. power, whatever you want to call it, the health. You're right. But God does the work. We don't do it. But we have to be supple enough, surrendered and flexible. We have to be malleable. We have to be pliable. We have to be pliable enough to be to be used, to be ready. Like if you're stubbornly standing at the door resisting, that power can't help us because we're not allowing it in. We can't even see. Well, you know what? I got to read this to you because this this I just wrote this on June 28th, and I don't even know what where I found it, but it says, "Keep me in the moment." Keep my eyes wide open. I don't want to miss what you have for me. Mm, I love that. Keep me in the moment. Mm -hmm. Keep my keep me in the moment. Keep my eyes open. I don't want to miss what you have for me. Oh, I love that. And keep you in the moment right now, the present moment where we're in right now, without one worry in the future yeah. or any regret in the past, is where God intersects humanity in the vertical region, not the horizontal time where the past is so full of regret or the future is full That's of right. regret. It's here now. It's like, be here now. Yeah. And you know, um, whenever you said that about keep me in the moment, and this is what people need to know, and this is coming from my practitioner standpoint. Yeah. Living in the past causes depression. Yeah. Living in the future causes anxiety. And that's why they call today the present, because it's a gift. Exactly. <laughs> or as I always say, if you have one foot in tomorrow and one foot in yesterday, you're pissing on today. <laughs> that's fabulous i like that <laughs> but prayer does change things in fact emmett fox as an essay i gave to my brother before he passed away he used to carry my s my little um i used to write to my brother all the time hoping to save his life because he died of a drug overdose the first year i was sober and 
it was so precious to find these little folded up papers in his pocket. He was trying so hard to follow what I said. And I sent him an Emmett Fox article that says, prayer does change things in the physical universe. It really works. It does. We just open ourselves up to take that step and take and, and, that little bit of faith, that step forward. And I hope that, that people that listen to this pass it on to others, have others get involved, um, because I, I believe that this is the start of something very large yeah. that a lot of people are setting back in their own homes being like, what just happened? Or how does this work? Or And there's a lot of people having God shots. And we need a platform where people can come and talk to them, talk about them. We need to collect other people's God shots. I have about 300 of them that I've collected from other people. You have yeah. your own. I do. Yeah. Well, and I have other people's also. And we were just we were just talking about all this. I mean, there's so many people that are finding out I'm doing this and finding out about, you know, God shots thing. And they're just like, hey, this happened to us and this happened to us. And does this qualify? Oh, oh, let me tell you this. So my really good friend, who's a cardiologist, um, I've worked as his nurse practitioner, known him for over 20 years, right? He calls me up about a month ago. No, man, a couple of weeks ago. And he says to me, he goes, I got something to tell you. And I says, what's that? And he goes, I'm going to Cleveland to have open heart surgery. That's, a, that's my cardiologist friend. Oh, wow. Healthiest man, eats well, diets, you know, vitamins, the whole nine yards. He was sitting in his office in between patients yeah. and he was twirling his stethoscope just on his finger, waiting for the next patient. Yeah. In all of his practice of 30 years, he's never listened to his own heart. <gasps> he's And something told him in his brain, listen to your own heart. So he put a stethoscope on me, sitting in a chair back like this. And he went, that's not good. Oh my God. He has an aortic aneurysm. No. And he has, to, yes. And he found it on himself. He caught it in time, right? Yes. Caught it in time to do surgery. Uh-huh. Jeez, that's scary. And he heard it and he went downstairs. He said, I need this checked. And it was right at the right centimeters that you have to start getting concerned getting into Cleveland to do the surgery. He goes, I think God saved my life. He goes, I think it's a God shot. Totally. I said, oh, I believe it is. Totally. He's like, in 30 years, I've never listened to my own heart. Wow. How's that? Yes, those intuitive thoughts that come to us that are always, I always reach for the highest thought when I'm feeling like I'm, a, I'm blue, depressed, or being an asshole. Whenever I'm really being <laughs> agitated or too much in the human realm materialistic or whatever I, I always go oh wait 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 what's the highest thought I could be thinking right now and I get those you get those little weird messages and with my book I was so troubled with it for so long and I went oh, I'm just gonna ask what the next best thing to do is the next indicated step and I got it very clear direction and I got excited about it when it's nice. you can feel you resonate with feels good or something and I get oh I like that idea and I sat down and did it and I went, oh, now I can sit down and finish something because I have a map. Anyway, we we, we shouldn't listen to our brain unless no. it's hooked up to the higher realm, right. the realm up here, which is. Yeah. No, it's always in the heart. You always you always get the, 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 the good order, the direction, as you call it, from the heart. You know it. You intuitively know it. It's there. Yeah. You know, and then we try to rethink it and say, okay, well, this should work like this. And because we, we're on the human plane, we see it differently. And think um, about this truth always has integrity, which means wholeness. Mm -hmm. Integrity means a firm foundation. So when you're seeking truth and you're seeking what's real and what's false, be very still mm -hmm. and ask to hear the highest thought of truth and love. And I was going to say one last thing about the, the selflessness. Letting go of your selfishness sort of aligns everything with the highest thought, the highest good in the, in the world. And you're kind of in the right direction once you do that. But there was that famous um, story in the news in Arizona, I might have mentioned this to you before, of a woman who kept getting this cab driver, she kept getting this one cab driver every time she went to her kidney dialysis. And she was the grumpiest, most obnoxious woman. And the cab driver would be really friendly and he'd go, where are you going? And she goes, oh, shut up. 
get me there. And he was always, but he got lost. Every time he'd get lost and she would bitch at him. One day he went in to find out what was going on with her. He said, I wonder why she's so troubled. He found out she needed a kidney. And he went and took it upon himself to see if he, could, he was a match. Nobody, wow. she admitted to him finally that nobody was a match in her family and there was no matching kidney. Turned out he was the perfect match. So oh. it was in the news that day where he donated his, he was donating his kidney to her. And because it was in the news that day, his long lost daughter found him. She'd been looking for him for years. His oh ex my God. wouldn't let his daughter see him since the, since 15 years earlier. The daughter read the article, but that's my dad, found her dad. The circle of love was so complete by him doing a selfless act. And then the, so the wow. woman and he are now best friends. And I think that he, I think the whole story is on CBS somewhere. Wow, that's incredible. I always love that story. And I always wondered if, would he have been the perfect match if he had been a rude jerk back to her? If he had returned hate for hate? Instead well, he returned love and, for hate. And you know what I think? I think that that's where we miss so many opportunities in life. He might have probably still been the perfect match, but it never would have happened. Right. Because he never would have taken the time. And I think we all, when we get into the selfishness, yeah. and the control and the thinking that we're always right. I think that's where we miss all the gifts. All of it. We miss everything that can possibly happen and we create our own destinies, totally. right? And that's how it happens because we block the spirit. And when we block the spirit, we're doing it our way and all we can get is what we get. And, we and do that. Yeah. so much more to give us, so much more. God, that's so much beautiful. I love talking to you. It's like talking to you. I know. I know. Your best friend, person who really know you know, it's like so fun because we're both exploring. I don't know it all yet, but I'm seeking. And I'd rather be a seeker. That's right. And guess what? I'm back to the Bible again. I can't help myself. You're good. Right there it says in Matthew, I think it's Matthew 7. Ask, seek, and knock. Ask and it shall be opened for you seek and you will find it's there yeah. it tells us that's all we have to do oh i love it you know um i want to congratulate you on your position i forgot to say congratulations on getting this you. amazing gig every sunday for your well, and i'll tell you i'll tell you what i don't know i signed a year's contract so i've got like what 50 more sundays to go <laughs> we'll see <laughs> we'll see how that works out and um, right now, life is good. Life oh, is I good. I love it. You're such a delight. Thank you so much, Darlene. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks for doing this podcast. And I look forward every day when I wake up to see what's next with Lydia Cornell. <laughs> and Darlene Sperlaza. Thank you for having me. And it, it, we're interviewing each other. So, yes, yeah. we'll have this podcast up on Anchor.com, Anchor FM, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Breaker, and a lot of other stations. But we also have a YouTube channel, and we're starting the God Shots Company, the LLC, and we're starting a book series called God Shots, Recovery God Shots, Financial God Shots, Nurses God Shots. You can contribute your own in any state. Kansas City God Shots. <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. Look forward to hearing from each and every one of you and getting people on to interview and just a lot of fun stuff coming up. Thank so. you. Bye. Look forward to seeing you in Hollywood soon. Yes, Hollywood soon. <laughs> California, here you come. Thank you. Okay. Good night, Linda. Love you. Love you. Love you too.